Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. Now, most of us at this point accept that near-death experience science provides a unique way for serious researchers to look at some of these deep mysteries of the afterlife. But we also know that that road to discovery is filled with a lot of potholes. There's stuck-in-the-mud academics who can't bear the thought of having been wrong for all those years. There are well-meaning Christians, New Agers, and spiritual seekers, and I'd have to throw myself in that category, <laughs> who want to claim NDEs as their exclusive domain. The barriers to really understanding the deeper implications of NDE science are many, and that's what makes it so exciting when someone like today's guest, Dr. Gregory Shushan, comes along, he's got a new book, Near-Death Experience in Indigenous Religions, and it looks to me to be one of those books that really delves so deeply into one of the questions that has really been central to the ongoing discussion about NDE science. It's a question that's interested both Skeptics, they've picked it up as their cause, and proponents, they've picked it up in their, as their cause, and that is, what are we to make of NDE accounts across cultures? And, and, and a follow-on question to that is, how might those experiences have impacted those religious traditions that we see and the spiritual beliefs, which we're going to have to deconstruct a little bit? So, the basic question usually kind of falls into, you know, does the lack of consistency within the NDE accounts across cultures, do those mean that as the skeptics would have us believe, and I don't, skeptics, you know, you know, I'm just using to fill in those people in one camp who then use that to bolster their claim that maybe this is more of a delusional kind of thing that people are creating in their head or another way of looking at it is, do the patterns, the deeper patterns within these accounts, suggest that maybe NDEs have an even more richer, deeper influence on these cultures, all the way to maybe even being the source of the religions we see. So this is an awesome interview we have coming up, a deep dive, anthropology, religious history, uh, NDE science, world-class scholar, recognized expert in his field. It's really, really great to welcome you, Dr. Shushan, to Skeptico. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, Alex, and uh, thanks for that great introduction. There's a really good, good summary of some of the thorny problems that this kind of research has to deal with. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it's just the beginning, and I guess that's what I appreciated about reading your book. I just mentioned offhand that I feel like I missed the point in a lot of ways when we talked a few years ago. And I don't want to beat myself up too bad because I got one point, but I kind of missed the larger point of your approach, your methodology as an academic who is looking at this in a very serious way. And there's a lot of issues around that. So I'll tell you what, I've been playing this little game I call Skeptico Jeopardy as a way of just kind of moving the conversation along and giving you a chance to kind of guide the conversation. But I, I think it's only fitting in this case that I pick the first one because it's where I think we have to start. And that's just the basics of cross-cultural NDE, you know, who... who who are you? And then who are the cultures that we're looking at? How are we looking at them? Why are we looking at them? Just give us the rundown of the basics of your work in cross-cultural NDE stuff. Okay. Um, well, first you shouldn't beat yourself up because <laughs> the first book was really pretty different than this book. So I could see how it could, you know, throw someone for a loop. So uh, basically, my background, um, I started out doing archaeology and Egyptology, um, Eastern Mediterranean archaeology, and I was reading afterlife texts in uh, ancient Egyptian afterlife texts like the coffin texts and pyramid texts, which preceded the Book of the Dead. 
And I started noticing similarities between those descriptions of the afterlife and NDEs. And I had read uh, Carol Zaleski's book, uh, Other World Journeys, where she looked at medieval visions of the afterlife in the context of NDEs. So I kind of started thinking, um, you know, something interesting is going on here. And, and is it possible that ancient Egyptian afterlife beliefs, um, you know, the, the origins of them can be found in NDEs? So I, I decided to do a comparative study, um, Egypt, uh, Vedic India, Mesopotamia, Mesoamerica, and ancient China, um, choosing those because they were all so uh, diverse and culturally independent. They didn't have any influence on each other um, to speak of. Um, there were almost no actual accounts of NDEs from these cultures. There were a couple from China, one, one or two from Mesoamerica, a few references in Indian cultures, but for the most part, it was really comparing uh, afterlife texts. So it was, uh, there was some speculation there. It was a little bit more speculative than uh, the, the recent book, which we'll get to. But uh, just for the background, that was essentially looking at similarities between afterlife beliefs across cultures and seeing how they corresponded to uh, NDE phenomena, uh, each element of the NDE. So, for example, we take the Tibetan Book of the Dead and say, that's a text, let's study the text, rather than looking for accounts, however you would get those accounts. The, the, the starting point for you, which makes a lot of sense, was the text, yeah. and now you've kind of shifted a little bit in this research. Yeah, because there, there, uh, there almost are no texts from the ancient civilizations that I was looking at. So, so yeah, it's looking at, um, you know, description of the other world journey in a Sumerian myth compared to the same thing in a, you know, a, a description of the afterlife in a Chinese text or whatever. So, so it was um, finding that in these civilizations, there were this, you know, set of similar elements, uh, not only across cultures, but um, to NDEs. So my, my idea was that those similarities can best be accounted for by the idea that people are having NDEs in all these cultures and basing their afterlife beliefs on them. So, um, so moving forward to the, to the recent stuff, um, uh, by indigenous religions, uh, the title of the new book, a uh, near death experience in indigenous religions that refers to, um, and a lot of people don't really know some of the terminology, but it's basically what used to be called, you know, primitive or small scale society religions, um, tribal sorts of religions in uh, Africa, um, Native Americans, and uh, Oceania, which is the Pacific region in general. So the difference there is that with, um, you know, a couple hundred years of uh, missionary activity, or more than a couple hundred going back to sort of 16th century uh, missionary activity, explorer reports, anthropology, uh, we have accounts of actual NDEs um, from these different, different uh, societies. So in this case, I was able to look at um, the, not just the content of the NDEs, but how people interpreted them differently in, in each of these different kinds of regions. I guess I would, since you stopped, I, I would interject that, you know, one of the things I think that will come up in this conversation a lot is that the carefulness and the wisdom that you show as an academic balanced with the curiosity that's driving you as someone who's fascinated with the NDE experience and how profound it, it is. And, and I want to make sure that we kind of, that I get that right, that I'm not misrepresenting you because I'm throwing out something there that I don't know if, if you kind of agree with, but I think, you know, this is just a profound um, phenomenon. You know, mm -hmm. that people experience the afterlife. It, it gets at one of the fundamental questions that, that we've had through time, you know, yeah. does our consciousness exist? So it, there's kind of this cool headedness and this methodical approach that comes through in your work that has to be there for you to answer some of these questions. But I think I want people to understand that I feel from reading the book and looking at your research, you are also just blown away at the implications at every turn of what this means if it falls one way i feel like you're kind of going hey i'm open to whatever it goes but if it falls this way the way it seems to be emerging uh, this is huge do you yeah. have any thoughts on that yeah i think that's that's definitely the case um i mean it's it, it's such an, a, an interesting 
and amazing topic with such huge implications um, that it's one of the few things that I can see uh, sustaining my interest over all these years, you know, because I started doing this stuff in, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, maybe more now. Um, so part of what's been able to sustain the interest is looking at the different cultures um, in, in all different areas of the world. Uh, that's been great. But also just um, that central core question, not just uh, how do different cultures uh, interpret and experience NDEs or religions based on NDE, but underlying all that is, you know, of course, the question of what are NDEs and, and what is this, what do these comparisons mean for the idea that NDEs could be actual evidence for life after death. And, and that's been a, you know, that's a thorny thing to tackle because I think, as you said in the introduction, um, they can be used, cross-cultural NDEs can be used for people on either side of the debate. You know, people who want to say that it's all a, a hallucinatory dying brain experience or that it's just entirely uh, culturally constructed, um, or it can, you know, be be used as, as evidence that, you know, this is a universal belief, therefore it's a general, genuine metaphysical kind of experience. So I, I think even skeptics, um, even angry skeptics <laughs> that we've all run across, um, because this is like, you know, such a, a basic human question, survival after death, people have this vested interest in it often. They either want to believe really deeply or they really want to disbelieve um and i actually am kind of in the middle still i mean that might sound disingenuous because i put so much time and effort and and uh, energy and thought into this stuff but um but i do have one foot in either camp and and, and i'm not uh i'm, I'm whole, totally convinced of of the things i wrote in the book um but as far as like the nd science or whatever i, I still kind of keep um a little bit of objectivity and and I think keeping a little bit of skepticism actually helps uh, my research because um, often I think when scholars uh, do put their foot in one camp or another then their, their research becomes a little bit uh, less objective. Great well that's something we, we may or may not explore um, but I want you to direct us where we should go next because there's this book is opens up a ton of questions as you read it if you're really interested in this field. So I have some categories, methodology, shamans and entheogens versus other NDE research as meaning, you know, how does your research compare pros and cons of doing it the way that you approached it versus other ways. Religion, which is kind of your bailiwick is to look not just at the experience, but what it means in terms of creating new religions, forming new religions, informing religions, changing religions. Very interesting aspects to the methodology come up there. Mm -hmm. Metaphysical neutrality, that's where I'm going to get into kind of really, I don't know, the, the silliness it seems to me to even entertain that other position, but mm -hmm. we have to go there. Uh, <laughs> and then, of course, the accounts, the ghost dance, and then uh, finally my pet topic is, you know, are we still, as much as we're being open-minded and fair-minded, are we broadly looking at all the data we can in terms of extended consciousness? So mm -hmm. for the benefit of those who haven't seen, aren't watching this video, I wanted to give you a, give them an overview of the categories we might cover. Do you have anyone that you see there that interests you? Um, maybe it's best to get the methodology out of the way because that's kind of the most uh, boring. <laughs> um, it, it's a necessary, I would say it's a necessary evil, but it's, uh, you know, the, in uh, academic writing, you have to discuss methodology to a, an extent that's uh, not really that interesting to most people. <laughs> I don't think it's boring at all. And I okay, certainly good. don't think it's boring to our listeners. You know, I posted in the Skeptical Forum, uh, questions that people could post in advance. And a lot of the questions were methodology questions, which I was really excited about. Because cool. if you think about this field at all, methodology to me is what immediately springs to mind. Well, how did he do that? Yeah. You, know, what, yeah. He, you just said he took the accounts of missionaries and explorers. Well, we can discount those right off the bat, right? They're mm -hmm. secondhand accounts. And then we have this indigenous things. So the way that you do that and a lot of it is good kind of blocking and tacking anthropology that you know 
is is really fascinating. The other aspect that I hope you touch on here is you you lean on a lot of prior research, and you're really generous in acknowledging the work that other people have done, but you also point out where you think some of that research might have taken us in the wrong direction and how we might look at it anew with a different kind of perspective. So mm-hmm. please lay into it. A lot to talk about <laughs> methodology. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, with the, um, I mentioned with the first book, that methodology of trying to find cultural independence, and there was a little bit of that with this one. Um, you know, African traditional religions, uh, religions of the Pacific and North America are pretty much entirely independent of each other. So if we have similarities of NDEs in each of those regions, we can't say that it's because, you know, they, the myth traveled from one to the other. So that's, that's a non-starter right there. That gets one whole argument out of the way, one, one whole uh, reductionist explanation for what's going on. Um, but you're right, the... Um, missionary explorer and even the early anthropology accounts um you know we have to look at them with a skeptical eye uh we we can't just uh accept everything they say as a neutral statement of of what uh really was said um but at the same time that doesn't mean that they're all entirely made up um by the missionaries and explorers and, and early anthropologists um what i've found a lot of times is uh an account will be um more or less neutrally recorded, um, but with a lot of interjections on the part of the missionary. Like, um, uh, you know, they'll say this person uh, claims to have died and traveled to the underworld and and met uh, this this uh, one of their gods and blah, blah, blah. And then at the end they say, of course, this is the work of Satan and these people <laughs> are, uh, you know, need to be converted or, or whatever. Um, Explorers were a little bit more neutral than than missionaries, um, but of course, you know they had their agenda of wanting to report what kind of resources there were and how to how to manage or exploit the local population. So, so everyone had their agenda, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all these accounts are just being made up by these people. Well, well, and that's what comes through in the book because you start reading these accounts and you can see exactly what you're saying. You can right. see an account that clearly could only come from the experiencer, couldn't have been added to in any way. When I said, mm-hmm. you know, I was taken by this coyote and we sailed across a creek, you know, mm-hmm. and then I met, you know, no one's making that up. That's right. just what the guy said. So it, it, it is right. kind of interesting that how you can do this. And then, as you mentioned, there's other ways that you look at it in terms of, well, D- does it conform automatically to their prior beliefs? Mm-hmm. Does it change the beliefs of the group or the religion? This is some of the deeper stuff you get into, but it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. Thanks. Um, yeah, and, and there's also the, it's, there's a few NDEs that were repeated over time. Um, so one, a missionary would report it, and 20 years later, uh, an anthropologist, and then another anthropologist, another 20, 40 years later after that. So it shows that there's consistency of these accounts over time uh, that, you know, they're, they're not just being made up. And it's also the case that you can check some of these beliefs with later anthropological reports. Um, And it's also important to remember that a lot of these traditions go back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. It's not like suddenly the missionary or the anthropologist appeared and they're getting these stories that they're, you know, randomly uh, reporting to the West. It's, it's, um, they were already there. So for, for a long time. And also the, a lot of the accounts, um, were supposed to have preceded the arrival of these, uh, these foreigners and, um, go back, you know, dozens or hundreds of years. And they've, these NDEs have become integrated into local mythology. So that's another, um, you know, methodological conceptual difference with the first book is, um, with, with these accounts in the indigenous religions, we have actual, you know, verbatim, in some cases, examples of people saying, describing NDEs that they had or that somebody in their culture had and saying outright, um, and this is how we know about the afterlife. So this is no longer speculation that, um, you know, these similarities to NDEs suggest that uh, the beliefs were based on an NDE. This is people actually saying our beliefs were based on an NDE. You know, that might lead into uh, another category. So rather than you pick, let me bring this up because I wanted to talk about it. 
And I think people are going to clue into this right away, too. And it's kind of an important topic to discuss. And that's in these accounts, you're open that you can't always separate the shamanic experience or the drug induced afterlife experience from the I don't know if you want to call it pure NDE experience. Mm-hmm. So you're really open about that, that, hey, this is a problem. We don't know. And, and you go one step further and say, from the accounts that we have, we can clearly see that these are intertwined and intermixed, and we don't even understand exactly what that means. So what are some of the challenges that we face in, in terms of understanding this from a shamanic perspective? Mm-hmm. Uh, the way I... Uh tried to pick it apart was, and this is another methodological issue too, is my definition of near-death experiences, or rather not my definition of, but uh, what I considered to be NDEs in the book. And rather than having a set of phenomenological elements uh, to NDEs that are commonly cited in the West as this is a typical NDE, you know, I didn't say um, this is an NDE because it ticks all these boxes. I said, um, this is an NDE if the person within the culture considers it an NDE. And obviously they didn't have the term NDE, but if the account says this person died, had this particular experience and came back to life, then that counted as an, as an NDE to me. Um, if the person- And even that, I think, with all the controversy that's going on around near-death experience and near-death experience science, even those terms are highly, highly charged, right? Yeah. What does death mean? You know, we you can get- to the map with people about, you know, it, they're not really dead because they had a NDE. It means right. that they came back and you can get into all that kind of definitional stuff. But uh, that's even more the case here because here now you're getting into shamanic induced NDEs where yeah. we really can't even imagine that they really ever were clinically dead in a lot of these cases, mm-hmm. but have yet just had some kind of extended consciousness experience. But for very good reason, like you just mentioned, you had to throw those in or you chose to throw those in and say, you know, let's understand it from this kind of if they say it's a walk on the side of death. Good enough for me. Let's see where that Mm -hmm. takes me. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. I mean, uh, they don't necessarily have to have said uh, died and came back to life, but um, the person was uh, in a physically compromised situation. Um, you know, technically near death rather than, you know, a claim of actual death, um, grave illness or or some kind of serious accident or near drowning, those kind of things I, I counted. Um, if they didn't have any context at all like that, I considered it a, a vision, a self-induced shamanic vision. But what you're, what you're talking about where the gray area lies is um, when there are shamanic practices that compromise the, the physical body and lead to an NDE. So there's some where they, you know, literally would club themselves to death in order to bring about an NDE. Um, Beyond even clubbing themselves, maybe I'm wrong, so correct me here, but I read that, you know, there's people that, and again, it plays right into, I think, one of the conclusions, if I can say that of your book, is Mm -hmm. that the near-death experiences that are really profound and significant in terms of a culture would a lot of times make the shaman then want to experience it and try anything they could to go on that death journey. So you yeah, know, clubbing absolutely. is one aspect of it, but however I can get there, whether it's not sleeping, drumming, and yeah. the there's a journey there. You took it. I want to take it. Yeah. Yeah. Clubbing is an extreme example. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, even, there's also one where um, they claim to have lit themselves on fire. And, you know, some of these I think have to be taken in the kind of context of these things are all mythologized um, oftentimes. So I don't think uh, people probably really did light themselves on fire to have an NDE, but yeah, the more usual ways are, um, you know, uh, drumming and dancing and singing to the point of exhaustion and collapse. Um, drug use and, and things like that. So, and, and yeah, in a lot of cases, it, it overtly is um, intended to replicate the, an NDE that somebody else uh, within their society had. And that's what the ghost dance really was all about. And, and the, you know, all these other ghost dance type of religions, uh, which also um, occur in, in the Pacific region as well with kind of similar uh, dynamics behind them about, you know, responses to 
uh, cultural dom domination and either, um, you know, a resistance against, uh, uh, you know, Western influence, uh, resistance against Christianity, or, or alternatively embracing it. Well, you mentioned ghost dance, so I thought we might go there. And I think the sure. way that you brought it up is is really important because it does get back to this methodology kind of thing in that, well, first you ought to describe what the ghost dance is, but I want to emphasize that point that you just made is that it's hard not to see the ghost dance as being a direct result of the NDE experience. Mm -hmm. And then that just leads to a whole bunch of questions. Well, what does that mean about how these religions really were formed, maintained, and energized and enlivened? You know, yeah. was it all about NDE? Um, I think some of these uh, ghost dance type of religions really were. I mean, they, it, it's interesting because um, these things have been studied since the 19th century when, you know, when they were actually happening. Um, and uh, most of the focus has been on the social and political dimensions about, uh, you know, response to Christianity and response to threat. And that's, that's how they've been studied in various parts of the world. And, and it's true that that's how, um, that is one of the main reasons they come into being as a, as a new religion that's revitalized. They're called re religious revitalization movements. And basically it's, uh, they appear during times of threat. Um, from other kind of uh, cultural dominance or or um, some other kind of external threat, usually. Um, in, in the Pacific, there's uh, one called the Kareri movement, and that was in response to a disease epidemic. So it's whenever there's some kind of threat. And what's interesting about it is because most of the time, more often than not, they're grounded in an NDE, or at least in a claim of an NDE. So uh, somebody has or claims to have had a near-death experience, comes back and says, I was told by... Um, you know, this entity in the afterlife that we need to change our ways, that we need to, you know, stop uh, beating our wives or we need to stop uh, using Western uh, weapons and farming equipment or whatever. Or conversely, we need to convert to Christian Christianity um, and these problems will be resolved. And what's interesting thematically is like uh, an NDE is it's death and rebirth. And one of the main themes of when somebody comes back from an NDE, they're renewed. They have this whole, you know, spiritual renaissance. Um, sometimes they claim to have new abilities and it really changes their lives. So what's happening in these uh, new religious movements is that is then being kind of um, outwardly uh, focused upon the whole society at large. So the whole society is then benefiting in theory uh, from this one person's NDE. Um, you know, wanting the whole society to become reborn and renewed and revitalized in that way. And that's tricky and thorny, as you just mentioned. What comes through in the book and in your research is that sorting and sifting through that and looking at the uh, anomalies uh, isn't quite the right word, but the cases where people come back with beliefs that are directly contradictory to what the current religious beliefs are and yet are so influential, so powerful that they cause the culture to change or they definitely right. cause that person to change. And then the way right. that that person changes causes other people to change. So there's always going to be these cultural overlays and then even the social engineering. You know, we just had a, a wonderful uh, gentleman on, uh, a few episodes ago, an anthropologist, uh, Brian Hayden, who mm -hmm. did this work on the self-aggrandizement, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. hey, I went to the other side too. And you know yeah. what he said? I should be able to sleep with your wife and all the other women that I choose to. That's what they said. Hey, that is always in play. There's always going to be people that are going to do that. So yeah. what interests me more are these cases where we can't give those kind of explanations we can't provide that that doesn't really fill in the gap so yeah. any thoughts on that yeah there's there's a, a good native american example of that um, i can't remember the the person's name but um you know there was this big explosion of ghost dance religion starting with uh wovoka who is a Paiute shaman in the uh, late 19th century um then there was uh bianchi who um who's on the his uh, nde vision that he drew was on the, the cover of the new book and 
he went to see Wovoka and he, um, you know, he had his own NDE vision. It was not, not clearly in a, you know, a, a near death context, but he had a, a vision after a praying and fasting. Um, and then he went to see Wovoka and he didn't believe a word he said. He was completely disappointed. And he said, you know, this, this guy is a, um, a sham or whatever. Um, but then there's another guy who's the one whose name I, I can't recall at the moment who, um, claimed to have had an NDE and then just basically exploited uh, people around him. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was things like, you know, sleep with your wife. Um, you have to give me some money, whatever it was. And, and it turned out, you know, later he, he did, he was arrested. And I think he later confessed that it was all, all a scam anyway. So, um, but that isn't always the case. They don't always admit no, that. <laughs> no, definitely not. And, you know, and, and I think, um, it, it's that's one of the main you know another problem with this kind of research is disentangling what accounts are are real you know, that represent actual NDEs and which ones are either opportunistic or just um, uh, seeing the success of of a of a different person who started their religion and wanting to emulate that you know maybe not for for opportunistic reasons but just as a genuine way to uh, you know improve your your society so I, I think that's a uh, a, a very uh, thorny thing to, to try to unpack. And I don't think there's any way to really completely say whether somebody's NDE account was, was an actual historic thing or not. Great. Where do you think we might want to go next? Uh, wow. <laughs> um, maybe I should say something. I don't know if this, this counts under the account section, but um, uh, you know, should, should say one of the, the main things about this this research has been, and you touched on it at the beginning in your introduction, is is the differences between NDE accounts. So it's not just a difference between uh, the different religions and and uh, different ideas about the afterlife, but it's the actual NDEs themselves can be vastly different. So, um, and that's one of the key things that that uh, skeptics use to say, you know, well, how can NDEs be evidence of an of an afterlife if they're all different, right? Um, to which I would reply, why do all NDEs? Why would everyone's afterlife have to be the same for there to be an afterlife? And I take that one step further. I'd say, you know, the book just without even kind of addressing that, which I think is it's an important question. But when you dig into it a little bit, it's kind of a silly question. And mm -hmm. the, the silliness is the accounts themselves. You know, and I have a few up there that I put on the screen. And I don't know if you can recall those off the top of your head, because I'm sure you have hundreds <laughs> floating in your head, but there you know, are, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the, you, you read these accounts and let me pull up one of them if I can. Well, I'll just say while you're doing that, um, you know, the idea that kind of I, in, in the background of a lot of this for me is that, you know, the way to explain these cross-cultural differences is not to ignore the similarities, but to look at them uh, side by side. So what I mean by that is what, the way I see it is that um, an NDE is essentially like a, a triggering event, which has these, um, you know, I don't know the neurophysiological or metaphysical structure or, or system behind it, but what seems to be going on is there's this event which has this uh, set of very similar thematic um, experiences that it causes. And because each of us, uh, you know, as a, as a particular individual in a particular culture, we experience those events in ways that are relevant and uh, specific to our culture. Let me read one such account, and I think it builds on what you're saying. So okay. this is from the uh, North American Sunni. These are the Southwest people, right? That you, mm -hmm. you drive through Arizona and you see- Arizona, New Mexico. In 1928, a woman died of measles and saw a, quote-unquote, bright light in the room and left her body. She traveled westward to meet her deceased grandfather and aunts, quote-unquote, still living the way we do. The experience not only resulted in a change in the woman's own beliefs, I never believed that it could happen, but it really did, but she was thereafter made a healer and a member of the Medicine Society. Furthermore, her experience was inconsistent with Sunni afterlife conceptions in which the dead remain with their body for four days, change shape, become the wind, or enter the lake of, what is it, catchiness? 
Kachinas, yeah. Oh, yeah, Kachinas, of course, the little dolls, or into the Lake of Kachinas. This suggests that the experience was largely independent of its cultural context. So this kind of pulls together a lot of the things that we're talking about, but maybe you want to expound on that. But I think anyone listening to that can go, hey, you know what? I really feel like I could pull something out of that yeah. that I didn't know before. That's such a great example. It's a, it's concise. It's a concise one. And it has so, you know, hits so many of the, um, you know, ideas that are behind what's going on here. So she, she changed her beliefs. She became a religious leader. Um, they were inconsistent with Zuni beliefs pre-existing, which shows that this is an experience which is not generated just by culture. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a, it's a really good example. And, and it's a, uh, it, it shows exactly the kind of thing that, that I'm talking about. But, you know, it's, it's also, um, there are still people out there who are fighting tooth and nail to say these are entirely culturally, linguistically generated experiences. So, well, what are you gonna yeah, do? <laughs> that's not gonna, that's not gonna change. It's the, yeah. it changes by funeral by funeral kind of thing. But, yeah. And the thing is, I mean, I'm not, again, it's, it's not a case of, um, are these, experiences evidence of, of the afterlife you know we can talk about about that later but it's a separate question of um are they an experience to begin with i mean some people just completely deny that it's kind of a postmodernist, a constructivist approach um they deny that it that the accounts actually refer to an actual experience which you know is, is basically just saying all of our sources are lying they're making stuff up because they're part of their culture um, which is not, you know, why why even be an anthropologist or a, or a scholar of religion if you're not going to believe what your sources say? Well, um, you know, that's the other thing that's really cool about what falls out of this really broad approach that you take of indigenous cultures. You go from North America, then you jump over to Africa. And what I was kind of kind of blown away with is, so you turn the page and you get to Africa. And yeah. now, as you say, things are a lot different. Yeah. One, we have the problem that Africa is a big continent. You know, right. we can't make a lot of generalizations, but we can start to make some generalizations and we see that it's a different game. It, for yeah. one thing, the fluidity isn't there. You know, the North American indigenous people are, are a pretty open lot, you know, mm -hmm. stuff comes along and they go, oh, okay, we have to yeah. change. Or like the one uh, shaman says, which I thought was quite beautiful, he goes, you know, I guess it really shows that we don't know, you know, we just have to listen to these people that have been there because I haven't been there. He's been there. I take his word for it. And yeah. what, I, what I read into the African, uh, uh, and it's not across the board because you do a great job of teasing out some important accounts from these different African traditions, but it's a little bit harder because it's, it's, it's more kind of an entrenched uh, uh, religiosity, uh, mm. yet some of the patterns still come through, which is what's right. so enormously valuable about your research. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that's definitely the case. So it's, it's not a case that, um, you know, in Africa, they didn't have NDEs and Native Americans did have them. It's a case of um, not just that the experiences themselves are different, but how they're interpreted by the, the, the societies, by the cultures um, vary really widely. Um, you know, it's easier to generalize about uh, Native Americans than it is about uh, Africans. Um, there are a few examples in, with Native Americans. Like some people say, well, we don't have any afterlife beliefs because nobody's ever been there. So how should we know? Kind of the reverse of the guy you were, you were mentioning. Um, some of them, you know, just, just actively disbelieve. But those are really rare. And African societies, um, they uh, – in fact, let me uh, just find – I have the figures here somewhere. Just to kind of put a general context of the whole thing, um, for Native Americans, I found 70 NDEs or references to NDEs, you know, in a historical context. And that's specifically accounts where somebody uh, died or came near death. So that's not even counting the shamanic experiences. Um, out of those, there were 20 where they said um, our afterlife beliefs were based on these experiences. Um, Africa, there were 10 NDEs altogether and two saying that they based their experiences on them. Um, and there are a few reasons for that. And, and you know, we, that's kind of like an all-day discussion. But just to kind of put it in a nutshell, um, 
burial practices are a factor because African burial practices by and large didn't really allow for somebody to come back to life. They were, they were very concerned with um, preventing uh, angry ancestor spirits from coming and taking possession of the body. Um, so if a body rose after being dead, uh, they didn't think, oh, my relative has come back. Let's go shower them with praise and, and welcome them. They thought, uh-oh, that person is possessed, essentially a zombie. You know, this, this is like a danger to society. So first of all, they would take, um, you know, preemptive, preemptive steps towards that happening. Um, so binding the corpse. Um, sometimes they would just throw them out to animals to be eaten. Uh, um, they didn't go through a, as many efforts to bring somebody back from from dying as Native Americans might or or in the Pacific. So um, already there's a, a sort of a physical uh, factor in, in fewer African NDEs being reported. Um, and then on top of that, they, they're rather than like, you know, in, with Native Americans, they had this whole shamanic vision quest culture going back. So, so it's, um, you know, part of built into the culture to have experiences like NDEs or whatever other kind of, you know, um, visionary experiences. Uh, African religions were often um, more concerned with sorcery. Um, they believed that the ancestors were living nearby in the village or in the forest. Some of them were benevolent, some of them were malevolent. So a lot of it was managing um, these kinds of possibly malevolent forces on, on the society. Um, witchcraft and sorcery were all kind of uh, preoccupations. Uh, a lot of it was more you know, this worldly, what's, what's going to happen to us right now, right here, and not really much speculation about what's going to happen in the beyond. It just wasn't really that relevant to, you know, their life experience. So they were just kind of negotiating these things in a very different way. See, it, and that's, that's so awesome and fascinating. And I guess I want people to appreciate how our entire perspective changes when you look at it through the lens that you've looked at it through. So you're standing on the shoulders of a lot of awesome people who've done awesome work, but you can see how they would totally, I have to say, misinterpret all that mm -hmm. if they weren't considering the reality, or if you want to say potential reality of a real afterlife that came with it, a certain set of experiences that, are, are are real. You know, I did an interview with this woman, uh, uh, Jan Van Esselstein, who wrote this amazing book and studied the shamanic people of Siberia for the longest time. And just mm -hmm. to highlight the differences, you know, I asked her some of these questions and she says, oh no, they never try and contact the spirit world or the deceased. I'm mm -hmm. like, what? Everybody does that. She goes, <laughs> no, their religious belief is that you're not supposed to disturb them. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't say whether that's true or not, but as you're just saying, how wouldn't that then inform the experiences that you would have? And mm. but independent of whether people then have those experiences, they come back that might be less likely to talk about those experiences. Right. So it's, it, it, it's only when we take the step that you've taken can we, that we can begin to kind of understand this stuff again. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, there's examples from um, Africa that somebody coming back from from the dead uh reviving from an nde and and you know having stones thrown at them and things like that so yeah if you have an nde you're going to keep quiet about it for the most part in, in cultures like that i guess i should just say a little about the pacific while we're while we're here and that's uh what's interesting there is um polynesians and melanesians uh followed more along the native american lines um there were you know uh 36 Polynesian and Melanesian NDEs and uh, 19 statements that they base their afterlife beliefs on those NDEs. Um, Melanesia, especially, they were open to all kinds of, uh, you know, different kinds of practices like mediumship. Uh, they believed in soul travel, uh, possession, just kind of like open to, to all of it. Um, Polynesians, you know, for the most part, very focused on, on NDEs, total casual acceptance of them. It's like, of course, they're fact, of course, we base our religion on it. Um, and what's interesting there is Micronesia and Australia, no NDEs, no um, examples of people saying they base their beliefs on NDEs. And that's because um, in Australia, basically 
shamanic soul travel to other worlds took the place. And, and it's almost like um, the concepts of NDEs and shamanism there were so intertwined, there was no difference between them. So, so there's no real context of saying somebody died and came back. It's just like, you know, these are people who, who do this. Um, and then in Micronesia, it was just a lot more similar to African example with the similar kinds of burial beliefs and beliefs about you know, uh, uh, souls coming back and things like that. But it's just so, um, to me, so totally clear when you have zero examples. And and then in other cultures, you know, Polynesia and Melanesia, 36 and 20 of them almost saying, we based our NDs on this. Uh, you know, that's, to me, it's scientific proof. You know, you don't have to go beyond a speculation of our people basing ex- their beliefs on these experiences. Okay, where might we want to go next? Uh, you choose this time. <laughs> okay, I was hoping you might say that. <laughs> Let's talk about the cross-cultural kind of work that you've done and the methodology that we keep talking about versus, you know, other NDE research. I was just re-watching a video by the very excellent Dr. Peter Fennick. Mm-hmm. He's in a TED Talk. So he's right. talking to a very general kind of sciencey audience, but he's talking about the importance of the cardiac arrest research. And I think a lot of people, when they first get into near-death experience research, they don't necessarily pick up on that, you know, mm-hmm. that, hey, people are having all sorts of NDEs under all sorts of different circumstances, right? Mm-hmm. Jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge, drowning in a pool, just being really afraid or, or not being afraid and just having it. So the mm-hmm. same kind of mix that you're talking about, there's contemporary uh, accounts of the same thing. But the near-death experience research slash science that we hear about so much is based on a group of really smart scientists saying, you know what? To get to the bottom of this, we have to try and control some of these variables. It's almost mm-hmm. the opposite of your research. You know, you had to open up the valve a little bit and let in a lot of accounts in order to understand this. Mm-hmm. They're doing the opposite. They're saying, you know what, tell you what, let's restrict this to cardiac arrest in a hospital. Because mm-hmm. now I think I have a pretty good idea of the physiology that's going on. Right. And the conclusion for that more than overwhelming, unanimous, is that consciousness is surviving death in a way we don't understand. Mm -hmm. Because the neurological model is completely out out of the window. It it just is. Because whether you want to call it death or not death or whatever, we're seeing consciousness at a time when the brain, based on our current neurological model, shouldn't be able to produce consciousness. And yet, consciousness is there. It's showing up. So, Mm I guess I've kind of laid enough of the groundwork. I, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are of that uh, on that in terms of, you know, bravo to you for seeing that you needed to kind of open up the, 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 the gates and let in these accounts. But then, you know, any thoughts on the contrast of how that compares with modern NDE research? Yeah. Um, well, I think, uh, this kind of uh, research that I've done has to be taken into account in any theory of NDEs, really. I mean, not necessarily how it's integrated into cultures and religion, but just um, the cross-cultural differences in NDE accounts. So, um, and and I, I talk about this in the book. There's a, a section towards the end on, uh, you know, what are the implications of... Um, all this uh, cross-cultural differences for the idea that NDEs are genuine evidence of an afterlife. Um, because if, um, you know, if, if it is, if NDEs are evidence for an afterlife, then that means it's a universal phenomenon, presumably, and that it's ev- evidence of an afterlife for everybody who has one. Uh, and if that's the case, why aren't, for example, most people in small scale societies having life reviews? Um, why, uh, why is a you know a tunnel not a common experience and things like that? So, uh, and that's why I, I kind of go back to the explanation of the thematic thing. So there might not be tunnels everywhere. You might not have a you know a, an Australian person saying I went through a tunnel, but he probably will say I went through darkness and emerged into light. Um, you might not have a panoramic life review 
you know, described in a kind of contemporary Western sense um, in, in, you know, a, a small scale society somewhere, but they will say um, there was a, a deity there and he had all of the history of my life written in a book. You know, it's thematically the same thing. Or even if it's not that thematically close, there's always some evaluation of the person's life, almost always. You know, what, what, did, what kind of person you, were you? Do you have to go back? And if you have to go back, why? So to me, it seems like there's two entirely different set of questions there that have to be approached, you know, completely differently. And I think the methodology that you've applied is super important. I'm not so sure that I would be totally aligned with you in terms of those then raise questions that NDE science has to address kind of in a, in a different way. It, it's almost to me like the parapsychology example. I remember mm-hmm. interviewing Dean Radin very early on when he's kind of pounding away at like a real good scientist at these pre-sentiment experiments that he did. And he replicates mm-hmm. them two times and four times and five times and right. then 50 times. And then it's like, well, yeah, but you're showing a small effect size. People are able to see or sense the future, you know, 55% versus yeah. 45%. Show us the really extreme examples. And he was yeah. like, you know what? I think that's been shown already. That's mm-hmm. already been demonstrated. What I'm trying to see is whether this is something that is an innate property of uh, human nature, if it a, a, appears right. across the board. And I almost yeah. see the same thing kind of going on here. Mm-hmm. I don't think anybody needs to repeat at this point, Dr. Fennick's work or Sam Parnia's work or Pin Van Lamel or Jeff Long. Anyone who's fair and open-minded has to look at that research and say, case closed for whatever reason that we don't understand. Consciousness seems to survive bodily death. These mm-hmm. people are clinically dead and they're having a conscious experience our neurological, existing neuro, neurological models don't explain that. Where mm-hmm. I see your research coming in is really to go to that next level of understanding the, the, the really important implications are, okay, before we jump the gun and say, okay, that means that Jesus really is mm-hmm. mediating all these. It's like, well, wait, wait, hold on. Yeah, I didn't mean to say that it's a challenge to, um, you know, ideas that that NDEs are evidence of an afterlife. I just think that it's it's something that needs to be explained and addressed along with a kind of comprehensive theory of what an NDE is. Um, And I think, you know, I I feel like I've kind of, I've done that component and they can integrate it, you know, Um, whichever side, you know, I've shown that uh, NDEs are different across cultures. I've shown that they're also the same across cultures at the same time. And I think um, given a pretty good, you know, reason why. (laughs) <laughs> so fair, fair enough. So, so, yeah. so you're the not so fast guy over there. Like, hey, okay, I, I'm with you, but not so fast. You know, right. you also, there are some questions over here that are. Yeah, and it's exactly what you said. I mean, I, you, you can't have, um, you know, and and this is why I, I my research seems to kind of piss off both sides of the camp. You know, you you have people who are, um, you know, you know, almost sort of religious about NDEs and firm firm believers in it, and they're model of what an NDE is like is the model. And if it's not that in other cultures, um, they don't consider it an NDE. So they're taking the exact opposite approach that I did. Whereas I'm saying if, if they say it's an NDE, I'm going to consider it an NDE and let's see what it says. That's the phenomenological approach, you know, basically just reading what is in the text. Um, whereas, you know, to say, no, he didn't have an NDE or she didn't have an NDE because she didn't see a being of light she didn't go through a tunnel described specifically as a tunnel uh didn't have a life whatever whatever it is and that's why um i guess what i'm saying is i think we need to move beyond uh almost all the other cross-cultural comparisons uh before the stuff i've done have been just obsessed really with um what exactly is the common core of the nde um and if there's no life review then it's not you know that whole kind of argument where I, i just think like we need to look at, you know, the Grayson scale or whatever as this is a, a list of possible elements that can be included in an NDE. If somebody dies and comes back to life or almost dies and comes back, let's see what they have to say. We can compare it to the scale. But if it doesn't hit that scale, does that mean it's not an NDE? Um, that's where I, you know, I don't think so. And that's where I think overgeneralizing is a little bit of a problem. Um, 
just as denying similarity is, is equally a problem. So it's really just, you know, my only argument really is um, scientists or whoever are, is, are speculating, making theories about NDEs has to have to um, take the similarities and the differences and, and explain both of them in order to, you know, not be subject to the kind of criticism that theories have been subject to so far. That's such a great point. And if I'm going to pick, maybe I'm going to pick another one then, <laughs> because I think it leads into this, which I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm really accepting of what you are saying and I'm blown away by what you've done. And I have to mention to people, this book is an expensive book to just kind of pick up casually. We all get that. It's yeah. Oxford University Press. It's like 70 bucks. If you can afford it, if you're really into this kind of research, do it because it's really worthwhile and it's kind of a cornerstone kind of book to have. But for a lot of people, they're just going to have to pass on the book and maybe take a look inside or watch this interview. But don't let it dissuade you from fully taking in uh, what Dr. Shoshana is saying, because I think it is this part of this maturing of NDE science. It's going beyond the spinning our wheels trying to respond to the just silliness that's been thrown in the face of these researchers for the most part. But I, I guess that's where I, I still see in your book, I still see someone who is inside of an academic culture that really, to me, for the most part, seems completely ignorant of the real <laughs> science that's going on in near-death yeah. experience. I mean, it, it just is. They're not, they're not hitting on any of the real stuff. They're just repeating, you know, well, this couldn't possibly be true, last gasp of a dying brain or, or mm -hmm. whatever, when all these things have been addressed and they have yeah. problems with it. You know, there are problems with some of the conclusions and overgeneralizations that NDE researchers and, and proponents, more proponents than the researchers, because I think most of the researchers are pretty level-headed. But when I read this, you know, this is from your book, whether the prompting is biological, psychological, and or metaphysical in nature, set that aside. I get that you have to do that. I get that you're in an academic where that's the belief that 90% of the folks that you speak to have. But I'd almost say if, if we have to set it aside, then that's not what your book is about. Your book really <laughs> isn't about that. You sidestep yeah. that and say, okay, let's set that aside. But now let me assume that there is a reality to it. And yeah. I also don't like the kind of uh, forced equality here, you know, that the, the biological and mm. the physiological are yeah. really on, the evidence is really on par with the metaphysical. No freaking way. It just yeah, isn't. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you there. And I think somewhere I, I do say that um, no uh, theory has been, you know, comprehensively able to explain away NDEs, um, which is, you know, that's a, that's a big step for an academic book. To <laughs> so, so, I mean, I think, um, but at the same time, yeah, it is an academic book and, and it's not a theology book. It's, you know, history of religions, anthropology. So, so there is, there does have to be that uh, neutrality. And, you know, when somebody comes along and reviews it and says, I'm a crypto theologian, I have a religious agenda, right. blah, 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 which, you know, they, they say, um, then I can say, well, look at that sentence, you know, <laughs> I don't. And, and actually I don't because, you know, I, I wasn't, uh, I, I don't really have a, um, a metaphysical stake in it one way or another. And I, I think I, I do tend, uh, you know, to, I mean, I definitely believe that, that NDs have not been explained away. And I think the, you know, a lot of the evidence is, is amazing. The peak and Darien type experiences, um, you know, where people uh, see, see people that they didn't know had died and come back and find out that they did die. Um, and that's, how do you explain things like that? The sheer um, death experience is always one that doesn't get enough attention where yeah. there's other people in the room and they share the experience. They, they can't even pin a biological explanation on that, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, in another place I went out on a limb in, in that book is um, there's a, a section on, which is basically uh, given all these things about religious diversity, diversity of NDEs, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, 
if there is a real afterlife, what could it possibly be like? So, so what are the implications of, of all this uh, diversity uh, for, for an afterlife? Um, and I think that's, you know, that's not something that you're, you're going to come across in the traditional work of anthropology or, or history of religions. That's where it's kind of going into, you know, philosophical speculation. But, but I think it's, um, to me, that was treating the metaphysical um, interpretation uh, seriously and, it, and it's giving it its due. That's Whereas, such an awesome point. I want to emphasize that because, you know, I almost missed that. And when you just repeated it, 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 it kind of stirred up in me again. So I, I want you to expound on that a little sure. bit. It's like you're taking the leap and saying, okay, let me play the metaphysical game for a minute. And now let me try and speculate as to what the implications might be. And then your book is like, hey, doesn't this look like <laughs> this could be the implications? Yeah, there's a section on... Um cross-cultural NDEs and, and the survival hypothesis um, where it kind of addresses exactly that. And um, yeah, I mean, so, so it's kind of back to the question of, um, you know, certain, certain scholars, there was a, a big debate in Journal of Near-Death Studies a couple of years ago about how if NDEs are different across cultures, there can't possibly be an afterlife. So I kind of, I delve into that. And um, because it's true, if, if, NDEs are evidence of an afterlife across cultures. No single religion is true. <laughs> you know, we have to face that. You know, the Christian model of an afterlife, not true. Uh, you know, Islamic model, Jewish, Hindu, whatever. Um, they, and and they when you say not true, we, it's just not exclusively true because yeah, yeah. we don't know. I mean, yeah, that's, right. again, what your research comes through is that sure. there's all these overlays, you know. Yeah, yeah but none of these dogmas, let's say, um, have hit it 100% correctly. I would say each one of them has elements um, that are, you know, getting towards the truth, whatever the truth might be. Um, and to me, that that truth is where there's uh, convergences and similarities across cultures. There, all these uh, similar things that people are arriving at independently are probably the things that are closest to the truth. Um, so, so my, you know, the idea is, um, so if everyone's different, how can they all be right? <laughs> you know, if, if, if all, all these NDEs are, are different, even between individuals, and you know, that was recognized by, by Moody way back. He said, there are no two NDEs that are going to hit all of these criteria. So right. even there, how do we explain it? Let alone bringing in uh, Kachinas and ancestor spirits and whatever else. So, you know, that's another thing that, you know, as I said, NDE science researchers have to confront these things, but so do philosophers and theologians about the afterlife. Um, but you bring that around full circle and say, you could also look at it and turn the question around and say, well, isn't that really evidence that there is something deeper going on, right? Yeah, yeah, you, you could definitely look at it that way. Um, and yeah, that, that's where I kind of come to an impasse. The the, the issue of similarity to me, it demonstrates NDEs, it demonstrates their influence on religion, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, just to be perfectly objective about it, it doesn't necessarily demonstrate that NDEs are actual evidence of an afterlife. But Fair enough, fair enough. I, I guess what struck me, because I am at this point pretty solidly convinced just by the evidence that, because I've yeah. talk to all those people multiple times and I just can't shoot holes in there. <laughs> yeah. Their yeah. No, I, I understand. But, but one of the things that, that I liked about what, what you do, did and, and where you brought me to is speculating, imagining how these experiences may have informed these religions may have influenced these religions, you know, and yeah. uh, someone who posted on the forum uh, made the connection between life review and confessional in the in the Roman Catholic Church, you know? Right. Yeah. And it's a loose association, but can't you just see it? There's more uh, clear-cut examples that maybe you can think of where uh, you, you can almost see how these consistent themes of the near-death experience 
do seem to be organically emerging in these religions. And it's not organic, really. It's, it's, it's coming directly from the NDE. And a lot of times it's, it's co-opted and maybe not used in a way that we all think is so great. But mm-hmm. isn't that just the history of religion too? So Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's definitely the case. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's just a case of, uh, again, it goes back to the, you know, balancing the similarities and the differences. And, and if, if there really is an afterlife, how do we explain it in light of the, the diversity? And, and I think, for me, the, the model that best explains it is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with H.H. H. Price, who's a British philosopher. Um, he talks about a intersubjective afterlife where it's basically like a lucid dream that you're sharing with other people. And to me, that accounts for the cross-cultural similarities of an NDE. It also accounts for the cultural and individual particularities of an NDE, because if you're creating it as you're, you're going along, um, that would, you know, account for uh, the, the thematic similarities, but also the cultural differences. Um, I think it it really addresses a lot. And it also, it doesn't mean that NDEs are just a dream or that the afterlife is just a dream. It's another state of reality where you have this different level of um, creation and control involved in it. Well, you know what so many of the great spiritual masters have been telling us throughout time, and it's also a very popular topic among people who are interested in studying the paranormal in present Mm -hmm. time, is that that a better way of looking at it is that our time space continuum that we experience is a small part of consciousness that we are embedded in and that would explain it yeah, yeah. it's a dream this is the freaking dream <laughs> this is, and and that's what the spiritual masters have told us all along so we put it in this nice little box of time space reality but when we step outside of that either through and theogens, or any number of other experiences that get us outside of that. Mm-hmm. It all looks different. We get these downloads of information that tell us, oh, okay, I get it now. And then we have to come back and live our little humble little lives here. And I guess there's really only one topic left. I appreciate how you know, open you are, generous you are to playing our little game here, but it's been That's absolutely good. delightful. And, but here's a tough one. You know, oh, sorry. I just, I just remembered. I didn't quite answer your previous question about uh, Christianity and confessional stuff. I was just going to add that um, uh, when we have the kind, and this is what, like kind of wider implications of of this book is when we have all these examples of people in different societies saying our religions are based on NDEs or our afterlife beliefs are based on NDEs. There's no reason to think that Christianity would be any different or uh, any other religion would be any different. So. Um, and I think it probably is the case because there are plenty of, uh, you know, NDEs and Christian traditions and going back to medieval times. And some people think St. Paul's vision was an NDE. So it definitely has some similarities to it. There's Greek. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because we kind of just jumped right in the middle of it, assuming that people understand that this is like the next chapter in (laughs) in this book. It's not assuming that we have to go look at indigenous people because, they are the only ones who are, whose, you know, little puny religions have been, you know, manipulated by these NDEs. It's like, no, it's the opposite. It's like, because you can get that, like you said at the beginning, because you can get that cross-cultural wide, the myth can't travel during these periods kind of thing. So, yeah. And, and, you know, uh, Pure Land Buddhism, for example, is, you know, very clearly, um, you know, NDs are very central to that religion. So it's not, it's, you know, there are examples that are not just, you know, small scale societies. So, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, very good. As, as with all your other ones, great point. So he, he, here's my last topic, and this is going to be way outside of your uh, swing zone, but hey, that's part of the fun of uh, kind of <laughs> pushing, pushing to other things. I've been doing a lot of research and investigation lately, and it's got to be research because the the claim that human beings are contacting non-human intelligence is reaching the point of something that we can actually talk about without being kind of laughed out of the room. I reference uh, Ray Hernandez, who's along with uh, Harvard social scientist uh, Rudy Shields has published the first 
academic survey of non-human intelligence contact with people. It parallels some of the work of Dr. Jeff Long, radiation oncologist, who's done the similar largest database for NDE research. And then with the disclosure, you know, a lot of people, I always have to say this because people forget, we have the New York Times coming out and saying, okay, UFOs are real. Here's mm -hmm. the video released by the Department of Defense. There, yeah. For whatever reason, we're in this mode where we can now put this stuff on the table. I wonder what we might think 20 years from now, how we might consider almost in parallel with the near-death experience, the role of contact with non-human intelligence. So, and this does have more of a direct connection to your book because if we accept the shamanic experience as being not just a near-death experience, but somehow possibly some connection with these extended consciousness realms, well, then we're right in the soup with E.T. and all the rest of it, because mm -hmm. E.T. is showing up all the time there. You know, even from our Dr. Rick Strassman in New Mexico, who gives his subjects DMT, and I say, oh, there it is. There's E.T. over there, you know. <laughs> so any thoughts? I know this is really a, a stretch, but the reason I titled this slide, this slide Silos is in the same way that your work moves us forward by kind of breaking down some of these barriers and talking about the stuff that really we have to address. I think this is another one of those things where we, we have to try and understand what's going on in these extended consciousness realms in a, in a broader way rather than immediately pigeonholing it and stifling it down saying, oh, it can only be this or it can only be yeah. that. Yeah, I, th I mean, that's that's where, um, you know, I was talking about the H.H. Price model of, you know, the lucid dreaming afterlife, collective lucid dreaming. Um, you know, it always, I kind of get tripped up when I think, okay, well, but what about these, uh, you know, divine beings and uh, kachinas and whatever other kind of, um, you know, deity or whatever is encountered? Are those... Um, would those be uh, souls of the dead who have reached a certain stage of transformation or development or whatever? Or is and, it and what does that, let me interject right there, because that's, people slide over that. What does that even mean? If it's yeah. a stage of development or transformation, now we're all automatically uh, uh, suggesting that there is a hierarchy to those extended realms. If there's a right. hierarchy, is there a top of that hierarchy? Is there God, uh, for lack of a better term, that we, we're not comfortable with saying? But that is the the... The, the accounts come through just consistently over and over again, but please keep going with your flow. Don't bother going back. <laughs> um, yeah. Or if not a hierarchy, at least a, um, a, a I mean, I think there can be uh, this kind of transformation without there being necessarily a, you know, like a system or bureaucracy. And it's, it's when I start hearing things like that, that make me really skeptical about afterlife. Um, but I have but, to, then let me interject there. That uh, is directly what, uh, Dr. Jeff Long, and again, for people who aren't familiar with his research, this is not a guy who has a religious agenda. Yeah. It's a radiation oncologist who just starts collecting these cases. And in his latest book, God in the Afterlife, which has a provocative title that throws everyone off, I, I interviewed him. Anyone can watch it. It's an extremely popular interview. And he mm -hmm. says, hey, I didn't go looking for this. This is just what the data says. And yeah. as a matter of fact, what he says is interesting from a, a social science standpoint, like you said. He said, I don't know why this is so underreported. This yeah. is more, it, just go look at my database that's online. This is much more widely reported than the tunnel, than, you know, all the travel, all these other things is an experience yeah. of God, an experience of hierarchy. That being was higher than me in a way that has been explained to me as God throughout my life. So I'm calling yeah. it God. So that's yeah. the kind of stuff that I think I'm not saying I'm going there. I don't have, I'm not a Christian. I'm not mm -hmm. religious. I don't have that agenda. I'm just saying I'm not, I don't think we should immediately put that aside if that's where the data takes yeah. us. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, I would, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if those kind of entities would be, like I said, some kind of transformed human soul or something totally different, you know, from a, an alien or different type of deity entity or whatever. Uh, I don't know how that could even 
be addressed. But I guess the, you know, the, re, the my skepticism arises not just with hierarchies, but systems. And when I, when people say there's a library and there's columns and, and Greek ropes, it's just like that, you know, I shut down. Not, not, for, not that I disbelieve the person experienced that, but I disbelieve that that is the objective reality that everyone's going to experience. So, um, you know, some peasant farmer in Siberia is not going to probably experience something like that, whatever, you know. Um, so I just think if there, if, if there is an afterlife, if these things are true, it's just a lot more chaotic than we think. I mean, think about reincarnation as well. Um, maybe it's just the case that it's true that most, so many of the reincarnation uh, accounts, Ian Stevenson um, and other researchers come from India where they happen to believe in reincarnation and Drew's people who believe in reincarnation. There are some in, you know, pop, very famous ones in, in the West, but there are exceptions. So, you know, maybe it's the case that um, people steer their afterlife experience, uh, in, whether consciously or unconsciously, uh, when they die. I, you know, I don't know. I just think it's... Um, hey, I think it's I, great like, that you went there, and, and that's a super important contribution to your books. We've got to keep emphasizing that, is the differences. You know, you're this anthropology guy who keeps saying, hey, explain, you know, how there's this huge difference, and this person saw it this way and that way. But it is interesting, I have to point out, mm -hmm. that that's the example you bring, which is Ian Stevenson, and they were all from India and Sri Lanka, because most of the people I talk to about reincarnation focus on the three-year-old boy who was right. in a fighter jet in Missouri who was walking yeah. past the toy store and said to his mom when he's three, hey, that's the plane I was in, and then mm -hmm. describes in detail the plane, who is flying with all this, harasses his parents to death, where they finally go do the research and find the pilot. Yeah. Or the other guy that, uh, you know, uh, University of Virginia, where they've studied this more than anyone, and Jim Tucker, Tucker who yeah. has, you know, you're familiar with all this stuff, but I inject it in just to get into the show. Right, the, right. the kid from Hollywood, similar, you know, very young boy who sees a picture of this 1950s movie and said, hey, I know that guy. And then they go through this extensive research and they have 54 points of contact where this guy has memories of this past life. So again, you're going to explain it away as this, you know, I, I love what you said about the, oh, it's all in the Akashic records and anyone can ex could go to, okay, yeah. but that's not what he's, that's not what the yeah. experiencer says. The yeah. experiencer says, I lived in that body. And as a matter of fact, at Ian Stevens said, here's the scar on my back where I got mm -hmm. shot. So, yeah. hey, I, I, I'm open to the shared dream kind of thing, but it is fun to talk about this with someone like yourself who's really done the work so we can kind of get to that next level because that's what this work is really all about is getting us into a dialogue about the deeper questions yeah and i, th I think i would you know the ultimate um you know summary i would have about as far as afterlife goes um you know nature is pretty chaotic life is chaotic um life is really diverse uh, human populations are incredibly diverse. Animal pop, you know, it's it's a chaotic, crazy universe that we live in, and there are some rules, and there is a lot of random chaos. So I just think that if there is an afterlife, um, it's part of nature. I don't I don't believe in like that it would be supernatural because if it exists, it's going to be part of nature, right? It's it's part of the human experience. So if that's the case, then there's no reason why we should suddenly experience order and similarity and structure, you know, when all these things are uh, basically inventions of humans anyway. Awesome, <laughs> awesome stuff. So uh, Dr. Shishan, how can people follow your work? I mentioned this is an awesome book. If you can fork over the 70 bucks or whatever to Oxford Press, you'll enjoy it. You'll get a lot out of it. If you can't and people want to follow what's going on, you do some, you have some great presentations out there on YouTube. I've seen a couple and other places. How do people stay connected with this important work that you're doing? And I guess I should preface that with asking, are you going to continue or have you kind of had it with this? <laughs> uh, I, I thought I had, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm uh, going to put together an anthology of um, historical and cross-cultural NDEs so people can read 
you know, the full accounts from, for themselves, because uh, these things are just scattered all over the place. You know, like I said, in, in this book alone, hundreds and hundreds of, um, you know, sources that I look through, anthropological reports, missionary reports, really obscure stuff hunted down. Um, and, you know, in a book like that, you can't provide all of them verbatim. So it's just a lot of brief summaries. So I'd like to provide, you know, have a, a nice, good anthology of those accounts, um, medieval European accounts, Asian accounts from around the world and, and stuff like that. So that's going to be the, the next project. I'm also going to do a, um, a book on NDEs and the afterlife in Greece and Rome. That's kind of a little bit further down the pike. Um, this book should be um, out in paperback, by the way, within, you know, probably less than a year. So that, that will, the, um, the current book on indigenous religions. So um, that will be more affordable at a certain stage. I've kind of been, uh, you know, pushing Oxford University Press to, to make it sooner than later. But um, hopefully it'll be, you know, early next year or something like that. Um, and I also have a website, uh, gregorysushan.com. And you can find uh, different articles there. The, the one on uh, African NDEs, I think, is or, or the Native American one is, uh, is up there. So a lot of kind of um, stuff that came from this book and also a lot of the theoretical and method methodological stuff. Um, if any listen listeners are interested in, in these kinds of debates where, you know, um, s certain scholars are saying everything is entirely culturally constructed and linguistically constructed, I kind of... Um, attack that stuff head on in, in a couple of articles. Um, there's one on Vedic afterlife beliefs. So, um, you know, I, I tried to keep this book, um, the, keep that stuff to a minimum in this book, the, the really heavy theory and method stuff to make it more accessible. So hopefully when it does come out in paperback, uh, people will, will enjoy it. <laughs> well, it's an absolutely great contribution. And I really appreciate you joining us today and talking about it. So best of luck with all that and thanks again. Thanks. Anytime. Thanks again to Dr. Gregory Shushan for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I guess I tee up from this interview is the question that Dr. Shushan is still wrestling with. And that is, do the differences we see in near-death accounts across cultures make it more or less likely that near-death experiences are genuine encounters with the afterlife, with extended consciousness, as I like to say. So I think you know my position on that, but I'd like to hear what you think and your understanding of pulling that apart in any way you see fit. So comment here if you're watching on YouTube or on the Skeptical Forum or wherever you are. Let me know your thoughts. Do stay tuned. I have some more excellent, I think, interviews coming up because there are just some extraordinary guests who are coming up. And be sure to check out the Skeptical website where you can find all these interviews available for free. Thanks so much for watching and being a part of this project. I really do appreciate it. Until next time, take care and bye for now. <laughs>